thank you, and, and thank you for coming out this morning. It's uh, unfortunate that we have to meet here on such a nice day for an event like this, but it's necessary that we do it. You know, it was interesting, uh, yesterday listening to all the uproar here in Washington about the crisis that are affecting the White House and forcing the President to take action. And if you heard him speak yesterday, he said, quote, I will not tolerate this kind of behavior. He said he would ensure it didn't happen again, quote, by holding the responsible parties accountable. Now, he wasn't talking about holding people accountable because they were holding uh, people captive for more than a decade. He was talking about holding people accountable for holding paperwork captive, which is a sad commentary about the state of our country when the tax-exempt paperwork of groups is more important than the lives of people that we've kept in confinement for more than a decade without giving them a trial or an opportunity to challenge the evidence against them. It's been encouraging uh, for me. A little over two weeks ago, we started a petition on change.org, uh, backslash closed GTMO. And at the time, we had no idea uh, what the response would be uh, to the petition. And it, it was encouraging to me. I mean, sometimes I've been doing this for a number of years, and sometimes I feel like Don Quixote, that I keep tilting at this windmill and get knocked off the horse, and that it, uh, it doesn't matter. So to me, it was encouraging that uh, about 210,000 people joined in to say it's time to close Guantanamo. Uh, there's some other organizations uh, that Medea mentioned as well that have also done petitions. So tomorrow, at noon, we'll be going to the White House with the names of more than 300,000 people asking President Obama to keep his promise to close Guantanamo. You know, it's easy to come out and talk to a group like this because it's really like preaching to the choir. I mean, you wouldn't be here if uh, you didn't believe that closing Guantanamo is the right thing to do. <clears throat> what we've got to reach are those people on the other side the majority that have been persuaded by the fear mongers that keeping Guantanamo open is the right thing to do because they're wrong. I think the president began uh, two weeks ago at the press conference laying out the rationale that he's got to continue to preach to the people so they know the facts on why Guantanamo makes no sense. I mean, for the fiscal conservatives who rail about excess government spending and waste and big government and you know, all the horrible things that government do, from a fiscal standpoint, Guantanamo makes no sense. I mean, I've seen estimates that we're spending eight or nine hundred thousand dollars per year per person to keep people confined at Guantanamo. Where in U.S. prisons, the cost is about thirty-two thousand dollars a year. It makes it worse that eighty-six of the hundred and sixty-six men, a majority, are people that we don't want to keep. The people that the CIA, the Department of Defense, Department of Justice, and FBI have reviewed and said didn't commit a crime, we don't intend to charge them, they don't pose an imminent threat, and we don't want to keep them. But every year we spend another $75 million to keep people we don't want in confinement. You also may have heard General Kelly, the commander of Southern Command, who testified before Congress recently that he needs about a quarter of a billion dollars to rehab the facilities, which to me I was surprised to hear. I recall in 2006 when I was chief prosecutor, <coughs> we came up with a plan. The vision was in 2006 that it would take five years to complete the trials at Guantanamo and wrap it up and close down the facility. And we had a plan to build a $112 million facility to make that happen. Then Secretary Gates took office and came in and said, you've got to be kidding me. I'm not going to Capitol Hill and asking for $112 million for a temporary facility that we're going to close down in five years. They'll laugh me out of town. So we ended up with the $12 million expeditionary legal complex that if you need to use the bathroom, you've got to leave the courthouse and find an outhouse that General Kelly says was meant to be temporary and was worn out and needs to be replaced and he needs a quarter of a billion dollars to do it. So if you do the math, if President Obama continues to renege on his promise to close Guantanamo, by the end of his term, we'll spend another three quarters of a billion dollars to keep people in confinement, the majority of which we've said aren't a threat and we don't want to keep them. So fiscally, it makes no sense. Policy-wise, both our adversaries and our allies condemn Guantanamo. 
You know, when we had Abu Hamza al Masri was extradited from England to the U.S., you know, England's our closest friend, our strongest ally. And in order for them to extradite Abu Hamza, we had to make a promise. We had to promise we wouldn't take him to Guantanamo, and we had to promise we wouldn't prosecute him in a military commission. Which, coming from our closest friend, is a pretty strong statement about what they think about Guantanamo and the military commission. And even the people we consider our adversaries. Uh, China recently published a human rights report where they condemned the U.S. for Guantanamo. Or you may have seen recently Vladimir Putin in Russia when we barred some Russian diplomats uh, because of their human rights record. He said, who is the U.S. to lecture us on human rights when they have Guantanamo? So what's the policy reason for keeping this place open when it's used by both our friends and our allies to show how shallow we are and preaching to others about human rights. Legally, every case has come out of Guantanamo, from Rasul to Hamdan to uh, Boumidien, has been a black eye to justice and to the government. From a national security perspective, I can tell you as a, a member of the military for 25 years, if you think back to the first Gulf War, the Iraqis <coughs> surrendered by the tens of thousands rather than fight. And they did that because they knew who we were and what we stood for. That rather than fight, they put down their weapons, they would receive humane treatment, food, medical care, shelter. They wouldn't be tortured. They knew that we were the Americans and we were the good guys. And so rather than fight, they quit. I question with the attitude of America today after Abu Ghraib and Guantanamo and waterboarding and in-depth detention and drone strikes, would those soldiers put down their weapons now? and surrender because they think they're the good guys, or would they fight? And I think they would probably fight. And as a member of the military, I would much prefer the enemy puts his gun down and surrenders rather than fight to the death to avoid being waterboarded and tortured and held indefinitely. So there's, there's no good reason to keep Guantanamo open. I mean, I would ask those on the other side, what's the reason? You'll hear them talk about you know, the worst of the worst, and uh, somebody said, you know, we don't want those crazy bastards here in our backyard. Those aren't good reasons, and they're not true. If you think about it, there's a story that's told, and I don't know if it's true or not, about either some cattle or some animals that when they're scared, you know, if one runs, they all run. And sometimes they'll run off the edge of the cliff because they're so afraid they're just following that person, that leader that was scared. And there are other cattle, Herefords, I hear, that when they face a storm, they stand shoulder to shoulder and put their head down and march into the storm. We've been sheeple for too long, being led by the fear mongers about Guantanamo. It's gone on for far too long. It's unfortunate that people have to put their lives at risk. Uh, my understanding is as of today, there are 102 of the 166 detainees that are on hunger strike. So nearly two-thirds of the people being detained at Guantanamo are on hunger strike. 30 of those are about 20% are being force fed. I know the Department of Defense said we don't force feed anyone. They've come up with a new term that makes it sound more palatable than force feeding, but you know what it is when somebody shoves it, you know, straps you down and shoves a tube down your throat. <coughs> I think that's called force feeding. So, you know, as we stand here now in 2013, as I said, right in 2006 when I was the chief prosecutor, <coughs> the plan was that Guantanamo would be finished and done and closed by five years from now which would have been 2011. So it's long overdue that uh, we bring this chapter to a close. So it was encouraging to hear the president say the right things at the press conference uh, two weeks ago, but it's time you know, for him to back up his words with some actions. So he said about the IRS, we're not going to tolerate that kind of behavior. The American people have the right to trust their government. Well, the world has the right to trust America and have that attitude they had back in 1991 when we had the Gulf War and the Iraqis chose to surrender because they knew who we were and what we stood for. So we need to stand up again and live like Americans and act like Americans and end more than a decade of indefinite detention at Guantanamo. Thank you, Code Pink, and uh, thank you, uh, the esteemed panel here. 
Uh, one year uh, was what the, prom the president promised in 2009, and I'm here to say that we can still close it within one year. More importantly, within one week, we can end this hunger strike. And within one month, we could have an innocent, cleared men back home. Um, I'd like to explain that to you in a moment. But it's been said many times that you can judge a society by how they treat their prisoners. And many people in our country will already be judged for what has happened in Guantanamo. President Obama is now faced with the prospect of either becoming a defendant or a hero. And as an optimist, as someone who supports the president, I hope that he will choose to be a hero. As the colonel said the other day on CNN, it's time for him to man up. Um, we have an upside-down system in Guantanamo. One where if you are prosecuted, if you're a war criminal, you are released. And if you're innocent, you are held. One that if you choose to peacefully hunger strike, you're forcibly fed. The bottom line is that it has to end. So how can we do it? In one week, uh, we can end the hunger strike. It's been very, very clear from the beginning, and I've been there twice since the strike began, that the men have very reasonable demands. Ones that can be met by the military, demands that have been made before, and that the military has accommodated. But instead of accommodating these demands, the military continues to drive their resolve deeper. How do they do this? Well, just last week, we understood that for the first time in the history of Guantanamo, when the men come out to make a phone call, either to their families, to their lawyers, or to meet with their attorneys, they're now their genitalia are being searched. This is something that comes straight from the, from the commanders in Guantanamo. It's, designed to break the strike, and it's incompetent because, frankly, it drives each person deeper in their resolve. And sure, uh, the men are hopeless, and they're striking because indefinite detention cannot stand. But we can end the hunger strike, and if the president wants to be a hero, we can close Guantanamo. So we call on the president, and we call on General Kelly to enlist those of us who know the men, who's worked with, who have worked with them for years, and who can negotiate a settlement to this hunger strike? The bottom line is that none of us want to see our clients perish. In one week, we can accomplish that. In one month, the president can start to send home innocent men. It begins with his appointment of a czar in the White House, not reappointing somebody in the State Department, because somebody with clout must be appointed in the White House, and the president must give this person the authority to do what's right. And the first thing that he can do is use the waiver, his waiver authority in the current NDAA to transfer individuals out of Guantanamo. Again, cleared individuals, people that our government unanimously agrees should be instantly released, are not a threat, and if released, are not a danger. So again, the right talking points that they will be returning to the battlefield, that's just incorrect. The CIA says that that's not going to happen. We should trust our intelligence agencies. With the right person in that position in the White House, innocent men can be home in a month. In one year, in one year the president can close Guantanamo, as he promised in 2009. How can he do it? The first thing that he has to do, and with all due respect, uh, Mr. Wright, you're Captain Wright. That's right. Captain Wright, the military commissions have to end. We need to have true due process, not the kangaroo court, the court where the the judge doesn't have control of this courtroom where Captain Wright's emails are being searched by the prosecution, where uh, uh, the, some intelligence agency is, is eavesdropping on his conversations. We have to have true due process here in the United States. And as the president said, we have the best court system in the world, and I'm part of it, and they are ready, willing, and able to try those that are accused of war crimes in Guantanamo, and if convicted, they will be punished accordingly. We need to release the innocent men, as I said previously. And for the rest, the ones that President Obama, a constitutional law professor, a man who has spent his life dedicated to the law, uh, we cannot stand for indefinite detention. We do not hold people for things they may do in the future. We must either try and release them. we must either try these individuals or we must release them. And if they are released, and if they were to do wrong to the United States, I'm confident that we have the infrastructure to deal with them accordingly. So in one year, Guantanamo can be shuttered.
I encourage everybody to read an article that was uh, posted yesterday by Newsweek, authored by Dan Clayton, where he described the internal fights that have been going, going on in, in the White House since the beginning of, of the President's uh, first term. The fact that Hillary Clinton called on him confidentially to close Guantanamo and that those uh, cries were not only ignored, but people close to him were angry at, at uh, Secretary Clinton for, quote, putting them in a box. Uh, that Rahm Emanuel worked hard with Republicans to thwart the President's efforts to bring people to uh, <coughs> the United States to be tried. The fact that this is happening in the President's own cabinet is disconcerting. But we ask that the President now stand up, man up, as the Colonel has said, do what's right, and, and be a hero in this situation. And with, with that resolve, he will close Guantanamo in a year. Thank you. So I don't know about this term, man up. <laughs> As a co-founder of Code Pink, I think maybe woman up or finding the feminist side might help him to uh, close Guantanamo. And speaking of the woman up, I want to introduce our uh, next speaker, who is a woman who has uh, put herself forward as somebody who's going to take responsibility as a U.S. citizen, and this is Diane Wilson. Uh, Diane Wilson is quite an extraordinary person. She is a uh, military veteran. She is a, uh, an author of several books. She is a fifth generation shrimper from Texas, as you will tell from her accent. Um, and she is a fighter for justice, and she's taken on many issues, including going to Iraq with the first Code Pink delegation while Saddam Hussein was still in power to meet with the uh, UN inspectors and hear from them directly that there were no weapons of mass destruction and there was absolutely no need for a U.S. invasion. And while Diane's main work has been around environmental issues, uh, she has been very upset since 9-11 about the U.S. response, uh, especially uh, having had that first-hand experience in Iraq. And uh, when Diane Wilson heard about the hunger strike in Guantanamo, uh, she was extremely moved by the plight of the prisoners there and decided that she was going to go on a solidarity hunger strike. Now, some of us decided to do that as well, but we picked doing it for 24 hours. <laughs> and in fact, there have been about 1,500 people around the country who have uh, been on a hunger strike or are go going to do it this weekend, marking the 100th day uh, as part of their solidarity. Uh, some said uh, they will do 24 hours, others said they will do uh, 48 hours, some said they will do a week, and Diane Wilson said, I am doing an indefinite, open-ended hunger strike. She came here, flew here from Texas, and she has been in front of the White House every day. Uh, she started her hunger strike on May 1st, so today marks, what is it, Diane, 17? I believe so. She's getting confused after all these days. I think it's uh, 17 days now of a, of a hunger strike. Uh, this is a water-only hunger strike. And um, she has uh, shown that she is ready to do great sacrifice to see some movement on the part of this present president to bring justice to the prisoners in Guantanamo. So I introduce Diane Wilson. Thanks, Maria. Hello, everybody. Uh, I'm real glad to be here and to see all y'all. And I am a uh, fifth generation shrimper from the Gulf Coast of Texas, uh, Vietnam vet, and I am a Code Pink member and delighted to be it. Uh, I have uh, been on this hunger strike for 17 days now, and uh, I know a lot of people, uh, especially in America, I believe uh, we are known for our, our consumption of food. <laughs> And uh, a, a lot of people have a great deal of concern when they see that you're on a hunger strike. 
you know, I remember when I was in the University of Texas one time, and I was on a, I'd only been on for like three days, and I remember the students there were just literally freaking out because uh, they didn't, they didn't understand how your body could do more than that. And uh, I know uh, on this hunger strike, uh, I feel uh, no concern at all because, quite frankly, I can go home uh, to Medea's house. <laughs> they don't send me to Texas. Anyway, I can go home to a warm bed to immense friends, and these men are kept in freezing cells, in solitary confinement, and the only time they're drug out is when they get forced to and I believe the uh, last man to leave home was, I believe his name, uh, excuse me if I massacre his name, but his name, I believe his name was Anand uh, Latif. And he left home, but he left home in a box. And uh, so uh, people uh, often ask me how long I'm going to be at this fast. And I always say, I will remain on this fast until those detainees start coming home. And uh, I am not the uh, only one on the hunger fast, uh, the open-ended hunger fast. Uh, we have Brian Wilson, who is, if you know anything about anti-war activists, Brian Wilson is legendary. He is a Vietnam vet. He is a uh, member of Veterans for Peace, and he is a lawyer, he's a criminologist, he's an author, uh, he's worked in Congress many times with senators and congressmen, and uh, he is beginning his hunger strike today in uh, Portland, Oregon. He is 71 years old, and by the way, I'm 65. <laughs> You know, when I, when I go in Cedar, people yell out their window, you're too old for this, but uh, I'm still doing it. But anyway, uh, Brian Wilson, uh, he, he made, uh, he said that his mantra is, is that we are not worth more and they are not worth less. And uh, the other one I wanted to bring out was uh, John Pope, who is sitting here right with us. And he is a anti-war activist. And uh, he comes from Florida. Matter of fact, he flew in and he said he was already getting confused, and I totally understand that. And uh, he said, uh, I will not sit back and let history roll over Guantanamo and let their injustice go unchallenged. And I just want to say um, I am delighted to be a part of the struggle. I can't imagine one more worth more. Can't imagine it. And, uh, and also wanted to let you know there will be an action at the White House, 2 p.m., and it's just a little act about the daily life in Guantanamo. Thank you very much. I think we ought to give a round of applause. For that. I failed to say that when Diane talks about a little action, she did one last week, uh, Friday, at the White House, where she chained herself to the White House fence by her neck with a chain that was so strong it took about two and a half hours to figure out how to get it off and had to saw it off right then. Right. Um, this will not be a, an arrestable action. This will be at 2 o'clock a symbolic show of what it's like to be force-fed. So we encourage uh, all of you in the press to join us at 2 o'clock in front of the White House. So our next speaker, we are really delighted to have a representative from the Muslim community here, and that's Imam Mahdi Bray, who is a longtime civil and human rights activist currently serving as the executive director of the Muslim American Society's Freedom Foundation, known as Moss Freedom, and former president of the Coordinating Council of Muslim Organizations. He serves on the board of directors of the Interfaith Alliance, Interfaith Worker Justice, and is a national co-convener of Religions of Peace USA. He also has served as a liaison between the President's White House Faith-Based Initiative Program 
in Congressional Affairs on behalf of the Muslim community. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. In the name of God, most gracious, most merciful, I greet you with the greetings of peace. Assalamu alaikum. Dr. King once said that in the face of injustice, that silence is betrayal. And I am here in Morally, morally obligated to raise my voice with those others here and saying that we need to indeed close Guantanamo. I am here to raise my voice against the injustice of the men who are incarcerated at Guantanamo. There are, I'm sure, many questions that I ask. The cold and callous will ask, can we get away with it? Will this blow over? The vanity of politics will ask, is it politically popular? But I might add that conscience will ask, is it right? What's happening to men at Guantanamo, is it right? I dare to say that it is not. It is not right because it lasts and it lacks, rather, justice. And justice delayed is justice denied. The men, the conditions at Guantanamo cries out for justice. This is what it cries out for. And we, as Americans, we're better than this. We are better than this. President Lincoln, when the nation faced moral crisis, asked us as a nation to call upon our better angels. Today, I ask President Obama, the members of Congress, the leaders of our nation, and the people of our nation to call upon our better angels angels and said that this is not right, it is not just. And we should understand that deliberate injustice ultimately is more detrimental to the one who imposes it than the one on whom it is imposed. Deliberate injustice. They cry at Guantanamo for justice, the justice that needs to remove the stain of this injustice from our nation. So I call upon the President, Mr. Obama, members of Congress, Leaders of this great land that we call America, I call upon you to reach out for the better angels of ourselves and our, our nation. And in for the love of God and for the love of justice, the justice that Amos once talked about in the book of Amos, that rolls down like water with the righteous, like a mighty stream. 
justice. I call upon our president and our national leaders. For the love of God and for the love of justice, stop this madness. Close down one time of day. Army judge advocate. Uh, he is a represents two Guantanamo Bay detainees. In August 2011, Captain Wright was assigned to the office of the Chief Defense Counsel for the U.S. Military Commissions. Thank you, Coach Pete, Pete, for this opportunity to be here today, and thank you for everyone out there for your interest in, in Guantanamo. I represent uh, two Guantanamo Bay detainees, one of whom is named Obaidullah. He is an Afghan villager who, in 2002, who was taken from his house in the middle of the night uh, by uh, U.S. forces. Uh, he was taken peacefully for allegedly possessing 20 landmines located about 300 feet from his family's compound. He was detained based on an informant's tip. Uh, a single source uh, intelligence informant, uh, uh, we believe to be an Afghan man, uh, received an undisclosed amount of money to turn a vital in for these landmines, again, that were located 300 feet from his family's compound. A vital has now been in Guantanamo Bay for more than 11 years without trial, without charges. And this is an outrage. That, that needs to be remedied. We recently had a defense investigation to Afghanistan last year and uncovered a great deal of exculpatory evidence concerning Obaidullah's flight. We found that these 20 landmines that were located 300 feet away from his family's compound had in fact been left there during the Soviet occupation. These were Soviet-era landmines. There are 86 men in Guantanamo Bay who are, clear, who are currently cleared for release, who are innocent who, according to the U.S. government, have done nothing wrong. There are other men like Obaidala, who have never been uh, accused of hurt anyone, attacked anyone, who, who are languishing there in that prison island for nothing more than sheer accusations. But yet they cannot get a day in court. They cannot contest the, the charges against them. And they cannot be sent home to their home countries, despite the fact that President Obama has the clear authority to do that. When it comes to the Afghan villager of Bible and my client and the other 16 Afghans, President Karzai himself, the leader of the legitimate government, government of Afghanistan, has demanded the return of the Afghan citizens. He wants that. <coughs> this government that we have built up wants that. Yet it hasn't happened. And President Obama has it within his authority to, to send these men home today. So I recently looked at some polling concerning Guantanamo Bay and saw that since about 2006, the American public has been relatively indifferent about Guantanamo. About 50%, give or take a, a small margin, uh, support Guantanamo Bay in its current incarnation. And I saw a poll uh, last uh, two weeks ago uh, as well uh, that wasn't uh, uh, from Gallup, I think it was from the Huffington Post, uh, where people self-selected and, and um, went online and, and chose their responses uh, about Guantanamo Bay. And again, I saw the statistics were about 50% people who support Guantanamo Bay in their current form. And then I looked at some human rights polling concerning the United States. And I saw that the substantial majority of Americans believe that indefinite detention without trial is contrary to American values and to American interests. So if you pull an American and say, is it appropriate to put someone in jail and hold them for 11 years without trial, the overwhelming majority of Americans will say, absolutely not. This, this country is better than that. So why is there this disconnect when we're holding men like Obaidala and the other 86 men who have been cleared for release for more than 11 years? Why is there a disconnect where some people say Guantanamo is okay, yet the vast majority say indefinite detention without trial is not okay? Well, this is the same question that President Obama asked two weeks ago. Why are we doing this? Well, I think the disconnect in the poll 
relates to the fact that people do not know who the Guantanamo Bay prisoners are, fundamentally. It's easy to dehumanize people that are just numbers. And I'm here to tell you that these men are not just numbers. Mr. Warner represents 11 or 12 human beings in Guantanamo. How many is it, Mr. Warner? 12. 12 human beings in Guantanamo Bay. I represent two human beings in Guantanamo Bay. A vitala for 11 years, a human being has not been able to see his 11-year-old daughter who was born just three days before he was captured. The real story about the 166 detainees, the majority of the 166 detainees, is not that they are the worst of the worst. The American people have been told a lie by the Bush administration about the worst of the worst. We started out with 779 of these worst of the worst, and somehow we're down to 166. Those numbers alone should tell you that this was a lie. The true story, the story that, that President Obama must tell the American people, is that the majority of the Guantanamo Bay detainees, these human beings, are in fact the wrong time, wrong place detainees. The detainees, like the Afghan villager of Baidala, who was picked up on a bounty for mere accusations of some sort of wrongdoing associated with the Soviet occupation before he was even born. So the truth, the truth is that there are innocent men in Guantanamo. America is better than this. And it's time for the president to take action with respect to Guantanamo Bay. He asked, why are we doing this? Well, the next question is, what can we do about it? With that, I'd like to leave you, not with my words, but with Obaila's words. I've been meeting with Obaila for about a year and a half now. And I know him to be a kind, gentle soul. He's been on the hunger strike now for the entire period, 99 days. He's gone from 167 pounds to, to by my estimates, uh, during the last visit two weeks ago, I would say about 110 pounds. There's a sense of hopelessness and desperation that is, is seeping across the prison of Guantanamo Bay. And I think this best can be personified in his words. This is a poem. A vital is a poet. He loves poetry. He likes to write poetry. He hasn't seen his family, as I mentioned, in 11 years. And this poem is entitled, Separation in the Real World. Somewhere in the far corners of oceans, in faraway islands, I was feeling so next to you. Through the dream of my hope springs. Such is the decision of fate that caused our separation in the real world. Give me a hand through my dream. I am fallen into darkness. Although I am along others' laughter, I have been ever living in deeper sorrows. I am living on a great ocean shore, but always in shackles. From its powerful waves, I hear the songs of pride. Angels in the sky show me the innocent desires of kindness. On sacred pages, they bring good news to hearts oppressed. So I thank you for your attention today, and we hope that President Obama will do the right thing and bring good news to these hearts oppressed. Thank you. Uh, I want to bring up one other person, uh, Rouge Awazir, who uh, has been in contact with people in Yemen, uh, just to give a perspective from uh, what she has heard. <clears throat> Thanks for bringing me up here. Um, uh, I'm going to speak a little bit more about uh, my conversations I've had with families in Yemen. I recently came back after spending seven months there, and there's primarily two concerns. Um, they're either um, faced with families in Guantanamo or having uh, or being droned on. Uh, there's this one family in particular. Uh, uh, Abdurrahman al-Shubati, who has been in Guantanamo for over 11 years. He's been cleared for release since 2007. His mom says, um, you know, if this were an American man, he would have been released years ago. There would have been a lot of media attention around him. But because he's brown, because he's Muslim, because he's Yemeni, he's been in indefinite detention and nobody's talking about it. 
the human rights minister came to uh, Washington, D.C. about a week and a half ago, expecting to visit some state uh, department officials to talk about the issue of closing Guantanamo and to start the transfer of the cleared for release of the, uh, the Yemenis. 56 of the 86 uh, are Yemenis, and so she wanted to start that conversation. Unfortunately, her 10-day visit uh, was cut short because nobody was willing to meet with her. The Yemeni government has been very outspoken, uh, demanding the transfers of the cleared for release. She came to start that conversation, but nobody was willing to meet with her. This is absurd. I mean, they, they say, you know, these, these countries are not, um, are not willing uh, to take back the um, prisoners, but that's not true, at least for Yemen's, um, uh, for, Ye for Yemen, the government, the president, the human rights minister, they've been outspoken. So uh, that's a question I, I leave for, for, for the speakers here today. I, I, I ask, what can be done about this? Why aren't they transferring um, the cleared for release? to countries that are willing to take them back, that are, um, that have, uh, that are, uh, that have rehabilitation centers, uh, that have ways of, of um, taking care of their citizens. Thank you. So let's have that open up the discussion and uh, I want to add one more example to what Rouge said, which is the case of Shakar Amr who is a, a UK citizen and the UK government has said that they would like him released. There is a major campaign in uh, England to have him released and we recently had a chance to uh, get response from the US <coughs> government who says that um, in his case that he is, uh, even though he has been cleared for release, that doesn't mean that anybody is going to be released in the near future. Um, that cleared for release does not mean innocent. Uh, cleared for release does not mean that people are not a threat to the United States. Uh, and so it leaves um, citizens like us quite confused about not only the terminology, but about the possibilities of uh, having some of these people cleared. So um, maybe we could start with the... Uh, uh, sure. Um, well, in, you know, I'm a federal public defender and I spend my time trying cases in federal court and I ask jurors every day, uh, finish the phrase, innocent until proven guilty. Uh, but that, that, that's for 160 of the 166 men. These men will never be charged. Certainly you can't be charged in Guantanamo. There's not evidence there. Um, for the 86 men, let's be clear about this. And, Colonel said it, uh, Captain Wright said it, our government has unanimously say, stated that they are not a threat. So if Mr. Litzow is saying that, he's just dead wrong. Can you that, explain who he is? <laughs> he, he's, he's uh, what, what's his actual title? <coughs> he's a he's detainee affair, director of detainee, detainee affairs for, for in Department of Defense. This is why there needs to be somebody in the White House, because Mr. Litzow will not listen to Dan Freed, who's in the Department of State certainly won't listen to Eric Holder. There needs to be somebody on the top of the chain that will wrangle the cats, as I like to say. So the 86 men, let's be clear, not a threat, agreed that uh, they should be instantly released and not a danger. So the CIA has said, no, these guys are, are nobodies. They should be released. And, and I'm going to go back and I'll turn over to, to the Colonel or to, to Jason, but uh, Lawrence Wilkerson, who was the chief of staff for Colin Powell, said, he said it many places, but he said in that declaration that Dick Cheney, Don Rumsfeld, the neocons, knew who they were taking down there, that they were taking innocent men down there. But for them, these innocent men, that was the cost of doing business. And it's left to President Obama to clean up the mess, but he can do it. So uh, there's not a, a real discussion from our perspective as to whether or not there are actually innocent men there. There are. The question is whether or not we have the guts as a nation to do what's right, and that's to release them. Yeah, on, a, on your point about Yemen, to me it, it reveals the hypocrisy of what our government is doing. 
Because on the one hand, as you mentioned, we had a Yemeni government representative came here to the U.S. last week, and it was encouraging. It looked like there was going to be some forward movement, particularly since it came right on the heels of the president saying all the right things again about Guantanamo. But then we wouldn't talk to this official from the Yemeni government. Where I see the hypocrisy in that is, look at what we cite as the legal authority for our drone strikes in Yemen. You know, our whole you know, justification is, oh, hey, you know, we have the cooperation of the Yemeni government and their approval to kill people, including an American citizen, in Yemen. So the same government that we say gives us the legal authority to kill people, we say are incompetent to take home their detainees. And you can't have it both ways. It's a competent government or it's not. You can't pick and choose when it's convenient for the United States to call it one way or the other. Let me address as well. Of the 86 that have been cleared, 56 are Yemenis. And so that's a pretty easy fix. I mean, I think the president right now is faced with two bad choices. It's you force feed people, which as you know, you know the UN has condemned, a number of medical organizations organizations have condemned because these are people that are competent to make their own medical decisions. And if they've elected not to be uh, fed with a tube, then they have the right to make that decision for themselves and they're being forced uh, to do it against their will. So that's one choice. The other choice is to sit there and watch them die. And that's not a good choice either. But there's really a third choice. And that is to begin sending these clear detainees home. It'll save a ton of money for the American taxpayers. It'll begin to restore our reputation as the good guys. And I believe it would end the hunger strike before dark. But I think people there, a majority of them who have been cleared that we're not going to charge are just frustrated at having spent more than a decade of their life in this Alice in Wonderland legal limbo that we call Guantanamo. So I think if a plane landed and we started loading up some Yemenis and sending them back home to the government that wants them <coughs> back, I think the hunger strike would end because there'd be some light at the end of the tunnel, they're getting the attention that they deserve, and people wouldn't have to be force-fed or die. Now there's some of the detainees that can't go home, like the Uyghurs. Well, you know, we have begged and bribed countries around the world to help us out, to help us fix the problem that we cause. It's like Colin Powell said, like Pottery Barn. You, bake it, you break it, you buy it. And we have fought the Guantanamo problem because we created it. You know, we claim that we're the home of the brave. Bermuda took some of the detainees, and we won't. You would think we could be at least as brave as Bermuda <laughs> and take some of these people that we have cleared and said aren't a threat and bring them to the U.S. And another thing I think we've got to do, like I said, we're spending eight or $900,000 a year per person to keep these people in detention. We can't just bring in a plane, load them up, take them home and drop them off and say, have a nice life. Because you heard the discussion with the young ladies that were held captive for a decade in Lewis, Cleveland, and about the efforts that are going to be required to get them reacclimated back into society. We've got people we've been holding for 11 years at Guantanamo, and we owe them a debt to help them get reacclimated. So if we just took a fraction of the $900,000 a year we're spending on each of them to keep them in confinement and help them get reestablished back in their society, I think we can reduce the threat. We'll never get the threat down to zero. I mean, I think it, there's a New America Foundation study that said the recidivism rate, depending on how you want to define recidivism, is about 8%, which compared to you know, any other you know, prison or detention facility is an incredible uh, rate. We'll never get it to zero, but I think we can get it closer to it if we help these people get back on their feet and reestablished in society at a fraction of the cost that we're spending to ruin our credibility and ruin their lives by keeping them in confinement. So we'll open up for some questions. Yes. Yes, um, I'm Ruben Valera with the Mexican Ministry of Women's Um 
And uh, the question that I have is very simple. We have been hearing, you know, about the necessity for physical biology growth on animals. And um, two weeks ago, when he was asked about this, he said that the reason why he had been unable to fulfill this promise is because the Congress uh, has not, you know, allowing him to do this, and that uh, Congress has not allocated or won't be allocated the money that will be needed in order to bring some people into the United States. So my question is, I mean, why do you think the President Obama, if this is something that I have not heard so far, is not doing this? Is is not doing this because currently he doesn't have the power. He said that he may consider some administrative measures in order to pursue this goal. Uh, so again, you know, what, what, why he can't do it, or why he won't, he won't, or he doesn't want to do this? I mean. Well, it's, it's a good question, and it's one that uh, the left has used for a long time to, to not pay attention to time. The bottom line is that in 2012, Senator Carl Levin and other senators put in a national security waiver to the NDAA. And that gives the president the absolute power, without Congress, to transfer in individuals in the interest of national security. Now, he eloquently stated why Guantanamo, and we, you've heard it here today, is not in the interest of national security. In fact, it creates terrorists. It's the number one recruiting tool for al-Qaeda, for the Taliban. It's terrible around the world. It hurts our national security. So he has the power right now to transfer these individuals, not only the cleared ones, but other ones. But certainly the cleared ones are, are the clearest example of the people that should be instantly tran uh, transferred. So it's a red herring to say that Congress is prohibiting the president from transferring individuals. It's just not true. Now, Colonel Davis makes a good point. If Congress were to lift some of these restrictions, the Chinese, the, the Uyghurs, they're, 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 they were Chinese people fleeing China and were picked up in Afghanistan, and from the very beginning, our government said that these, these were innocent individuals and we have to release them. But the right calls them terrorists. The right puts these restrictions on, saying that they can't come to the United States. That's what the president has to fight in Congress. Because if he could bring, for example, the Uyghurs to the United States, so many more diplomatic doors would be open, European diplomatic doors. Like the colonel said, many nations say, wait a minute, you're not taking anybody you want us to take them? Forget about it. So, so when the president says that he needs to work with Congress, that's not about releasing in, innocent individuals. He can do that today. And that's why I said in my earlier comments, uh, 86 could be home in a month. The solutions are there. <coughs> Dan Freed created them. Hillary Clinton, again, read the Newsweek art, article, called the president on the, on the card report, said, said, dude, this is what you can do to get these men out. And the president <coughs> in January didn't want to do it. Let's hope. He has a different attitude today. But again, I mean, why do you think that he doesn't why? want to do it? I mean, is it because Captain Wright, to... Captain Wright said it. You know why? Because 50% of the left believes Guantanamo should remain open. 85% or more of the right believes Guantanamo should remain open because the general public doesn't understand that you have innocent people in Guantanamo. That's, what, that's why. So politically savvy people, not conscious savvy people, politically savvy people like Rahm Emanuel went to the president and said, no, we're not going to do this. We're going to work on the Affordable Health Care Act. The 166 Arabic men in Guantanamo don't have a constituency here in Washington. They have us. That's why, that's why he hasn't done it. Politically, it hasn't been viable. It's not about whether or not he um, has the authority to do it. It's whether or not he has the political courage to do what his conscience should, should be pushing him to do. Did anybody else want to address this issue? So I'll just say that um, I, I think the, the Democratic Party has been trying very hard to uh, show itself as a party that's, quote, tough on security. Uh, that's why we've seen a drone program that's killing so many innocent people as well. Uh, and that's why we see these men being uh, detained indefinitely in Guantanamo. And this is all about party politics. Uh, it's also about a media in this country that doesn't uh, focus on what our foreign policy is actually about and so <coughs> keeps American people ignorant 
Uh, I think that um, what you can imply from what everybody has said today is the only thing that is going to push the president is more of a groundswell of opposition coming from the grassroots in the United States and around the world, and that's what we're trying to build. That's why the prisoners in Guantanamo went on a hunger strike to say, you have forgotten us. This is a call of desperate men. Uh, the fact that Colonel Mo Davis is not only speaking out, but wrote a very eloquent letter that hundreds of thousands of people in this country have signed on to, and is taking that letter to the White House tomorrow, is extremely important because it shows a renewed interest in this issue from the grassroots up. Uh, the fact that Diane Wilson and other veterans have gone on an indefinite hunger strike and uh, have become a presence in front of the White House uh, is something that I think uh, will become uh, hard to ignore from uh, people inside the White House. In fact, we have talked to people in the White House yesterday about it and they didn't know uh, that this was an indefinite hunger strike and uh, showed tremendous concern when we said this was open-ended to see some real movement on your part. So um, we are the answer to uh, why the president hasn't done anything on this issue and we are the answer to will the president do something on this issue. I just want to echo the response given by Medea. It reminds me of the old antidote of A. Philip Randolph, the great labor organizer and civil rights leader. He was sitting with President Roosevelt, and he was talking about the problem of discrimination and segregation and racism in America. He was, he was giving a list of all the things and all the problems that were wrong and that all the things that the president needed to do. President Roosevelt looked at A. Philip Randolph and said, Mr. Randolph, you're correct. Now make me do it. And that's what we have to do. We, the people, the grassroots, must mobilize and make the president, as Spike Lee said, do the right thing. Do we have other questions? Yes. I was curious if, you know, if anyone thinks that the camp leadership needs to be replaced in the immediate future as far as you know, because of some of the problems we have with prison there and apparently escalating this uh, it got to the point where it set up the hunger strike. So the question is whether the camp leadership needs to be replaced. Is that something? Sure. <clears throat> That's a great question, and we, we've had significant concerns in, in the leadership at the camp uh, for several months now. As you may know, there's a change in the overall uh, prison warden, if you will, the, the, the joint detention group commander over the summer, and then there was a replacement between the guard force, between uh, the Navy and the Army. And one of the concerns that we hear uh, time and time again in Guantanamo is that there's no usual. Every time there's a new guard force that comes in, every year on normal rotations, uh, deployment rotations, that the rules change. And for men who, many men who have been subjected to, to torture, to cruel, inhuman, and degrading treatment, uh, where, where the very purpose of, of torture is, in fact, to psychologically dislocate somebody, to render them in a state of, of learned helplessness, um, having these changes uh, can really uh, re-traumatize, in fact. And, and I will say uh, that, that clearly everyone in Guantanamo Bay has been subjected to some form of mistreatment uh, and, and degrading treatment. It may not have risen to the level of, of the legal definition of torture under the Convention Against Torture, such as Khalid Sheikh Mohammed, for instance, who was subjected to 183 sessions of a mock execution at Waterford. But what, what the camp has, has unfortunately done is they've put into place this regime that, that has such far-reaching insidious effects, that is, they're constantly changing the rules. What I have detected, now I've been going to Guantanamo Bay since September of 2011, and meeting with, with uh, my clients, uh, and also talking with other attorneys, other defense counsel for, for the prisoners, and other habeas uh, counsel, such as, as Mr. Warren. 
And universally, across the board, we have all detected that there's been a change in the command philosophy. Under the laws of war, these men are supposed to be, tr supposed to be treated humanely consistent with common Article 3 of the Geneva Conventions. These are common humane treatment standards. And at some point over the past nine or 10 months, there is a shift in the philosophy. Under the laws of war, someone is detained for preventive reasons. It's called preventive detention. And theoretically, at the end of hostilities, the prisoners of war are supposed to go home at the cessation of hostilities. But the change has been that the camp staff and the guards are starting to treat it as punitive detention. They started, I would say, around the summer, treating these men uh, like criminals, like, like men who had been, been convicted and sentenced by a court of law. And in the case of Obaidullah, for instance, <clears throat> when I first saw him after the hunger strike began, I saw him the first week of March, I was absolutely shocked to see what had, had, had happened to him, uh, to hear his firsthand accounts. Uh, he had been on hunger strike for about 30 days at that point. And the prison staff had responded by taking away uh, his, his personal comfort items, items that he had had for about five or six years. They had taken away family photos that he had had, had, had on the wall. They had seized uh, books he had had in his cell. They had taken legal papers. I mean, talking about a violation of, of you know, you know, traditional rule of law principles, they, they seized legal papers between attorney and client. They, uh, they, they took away an extra blanket that he had had, all of which he had <clears throat> under proper authorization for the prior five years because the camp staff decided that they wanted to take a strong arm with the Guantanamo. Now, if we, if we carry it forward with respect to the hunger strike, what the camp has been doing is that they've been actually taking uh, very direct and concrete measures to worsen the conditions of confinement for the detainees, to use their power, control, and authority, similar to, to the purpose of torture and, and cruel and inhuman treatment, to render them into a state of learned helplessness. They've been using their authority to try to break the hunger strike. They have now placed them in solitary confinement. And if you've read the 30-page hunger strike SOP that was, that was uh, released by Al Jazeera a few days ago, you'll see a sentence in there that says, placing men into solitary confinement can help break the hunger strike. That's a paraphrase. They have, uh, in the case of Obaidullah, I saw him uh, two weeks ago. He is in solitary confinement. He doesn't meet the legal definition of solitary confinement because he theoretically has access to the outdoors for more than one hour a day. It's two hours a day. But his access is, um, is subject to the whims of the, of the camp. Sometimes he, he can go outside if he wants at 1 a.m. Other times 3 a.m. Other times 5 a.m. So they're, they're constantly trying to shift and, and place these men in a state of learned helplessness. They have taken away his toothbrush. They've taken away his soap. They've told him that if he wants to take a shower, he can take a shower, but it has to be subject to their schedule. So sometimes the shower can be at 3 a.m. Sometimes the shower can be at 5 a.m. He's living in a cell with a mat, with a Quran, and very little else, with no dignity and no hope. So yes, I think there is a serious problem in Guantanamo Bay with the, the camp administration. Uh, I am, as a military officer uh, and, and a lawyer, I am very disturbed in that in our country, at least in our nation's military, we have this concept called the chain of command. And no one is watching Guantanamo. No one. And so if there's something, something has to be done. Something can be done today to change the conditions of confinement. The president, the commander in chief, can order the camp staff of Guantanamo right now. 12 o'clock today to, to put these men back in community living. What the Geneva Conventions require. He can do that. He can order the camp staff to start treating these men like human beings again. Uh, the fear mongers. I mean, a lot of people have acquired a lot of wealth and a lot of power uh, playing to fear. And like I said, you know, since 2001 on 9 11, we went from being the uh, you know, the land of the free and the home of the brave to being the constrained and the coward because we're scared. Yeah. And people profit and obtain power by keeping us scared. And so people bought into that narrative, the worst of the worst. And to be clear, there are some people at Guantanamo that are among that category. 
you know, the Khalid Sheikh Mohammeds and, and that type. But for every one of those, there are a hundred more that uh, have been cleared you know, for transfer out. So just lumping everybody into this worst of the worst you know, characterization was a gross disservice and a lie to the American people. And I think the president started the process two weeks ago when he laid out the rationale for why it makes no sense to keep the place open. But the majority of the public, I think if you poll them, still buy into that worst of the worst narrative. I can tell you, I had a tweet while I'm sitting here from somebody who said, you know, if these people are going to go out and blow people up, they're better off to starve to death at Guantanamo. That's the kind of perception the public has about these people. I mean, that's what, you know, it, it makes sense that, you know, the, you know, when the politicians say, we don't want these crazy bastards in our backyard, the public goes, yeah, you're right. We don't, you know, people are going to blow themselves up. We don't want them in our backyard. But that's not the case. So you, they've got to educate themselves about the truth about Guantanamo. I mean, I think the majority of the public is ignorant of the fact that the majority of the people at Guantanamo have been cleared for transfer out. So what is our job? Our job is to get your friends and your neighbors to not just listen to the Fox News soundbite, but to look at the truth about Guantanamo and then ask themselves, is this America? Is this the America that we stand for, that condones you know, this kind of behavior? Because you know, uh, I think it's Captain Wright brought up, you know, the law of war. Because this whole thing has been sold as part of this war on terrorism. Well, first off, you know, Guantanamo was chosen because you had this handful of people thought it was outside the reach of the law, but no law applied at Guantanamo, which is, you know, for 200 years, the law was what made us exceptional. It was our strength, and suddenly we're trying to find a place where no law applies. Except the Constitution says it applies everywhere, but it concerns this country. Right, but we had people in the Bush administration that chose Guantanamo. I mean, it makes no sense to fly somebody halfway around the world unless there's a reason, and the reason was they thought no law applied. So we went to this law-free place to hold these people you know, as part of the war on terrorism. And then we came up with this new classification of unlawful enemy combatant, which is a term you will not find in the Geneva Conventions because we wanted to avoid the law, which the Geneva Convention for the military was our Bible. I mean, from the day you go to basic training till the day you retire, we train on the Geneva Conventions, and now we had to come up with a new term in order to avoid the Geneva Convention. And then you hear this argument, well, you can't have army privates doing Miranda <coughs> rights on the battlefield, which is perfectly true and totally irrelevant. Because if you look at the people like Khalid Sheikh Mohammed, I mean, you've seen the picture where he's rousted out of bed in Pakistan in his T-shirt with his hair messed up by ISI, their intelligence service, or Al Nasheri, who was in a hotel room in Dubai when he was apprehended by the police there. I mean, I would tell the administration, if you, if you want to buy into this law of war, captured on the battlefield argument, then prosecute every one of those guys in a military commission, because you can count them on your fingers. Like, Omar Cotter was, no kidding, captured on the battlefield in any sense of the term. But the vast majority of these other people were sold to us for a bounty, were captured by the police or the intelligence service of some other country, and then turned over to us. But they weren't, you know, this notion that the public had has that some army private captured these people on the battlefield and then shipped them to Guantanamo where they're being held uh, because they're the worst of the worst is just flat out wrong. And so we've got to educate the public about the truth. And, you know, I think the public, if they knew the truth, would say, hey, this is fundamentally un-American. This is not who we are. This is not what we represent. And we're not going to put up with it. But I think as long as they buy into the line, the president did a terrible job. You know, in 2009, when he took office and he signed the order, I mean, I think he just, I think he was sincere in what he did, but I think he was naive. And when suddenly there was opposition, I think he was called flat-footed. And the economy was in a tailspin, and health care reform was top on his list of priorities. And as somebody said, there's no constituency for Guantanamo detainees, and so it fell off of his to-do list. And then the critics came out and painted this as either you're with us or you're with the terrorists. And the president was silent, and the public bought into that argument, and that's when you saw the polls begin to shift. As people suddenly said, well, you know, torture is okay. 
indefinite detention is okay. And the president should have used the bully pulpit to stand up and say, what they're telling it is a lie and here's the truth. And I think if the American public knew the truth, they do the right thing and we close Guantanamo and we go back to living like Americans. <coughs> well, I have to say on behalf of the American people that half of us do know the truth. What should we be doing now? Well, we've got to get the other half to uh, take the blinders off and learn the truth as well. And they've got to call their Congress people and tell them that, hey, you know, we've got to live like Americans and act like Americans. And if we're going to be that shiny city on a hill, we've got to live up to, you know, the words that we preach to others. We've got to walk the walk and talk the talk. And we can't keep doing what we've done for the last 11 years. So um, with that, I just want to announce a couple of things that are coming up, and one to say thank you to David Barrows because you walk the walk and talk the talk, not only in your orange jumpsuit, but in making this happen today. So thank you very much. And um, so uh, there is momentum building, and we want people to know what's happening in the next couple of days. So we mentioned that this afternoon at 2 o'clock, there will be a demonstration of what it's like to be uh, force-fed and that every day um, Diane and now John and, and hopefully others will be at the White House between 12 and 2. Uh, on Friday, there is a vigil every single week on Friday that has been growing, and that will be happening this Friday from 12 to 1 with an action after that that will include civil disobedience and will be very profound, and we hope you will join us there. And then on Saturday, there will be an action as well that I would like Eugene from Answer to tell us about. 